Welcome to the Exponentially Me podcast. Have you ever wondered if we can work better, if we get along better, and if leaders can really influence that? In this podcast, these are some of the questions we will be answering. We'll be talking to some amazing people from all around the world, not just thinkers on this, but the doers, giving you practical information that can make you a better colleague and even a better leader. I'm Ex Indeval, and I believe a leader is someone you follow voluntarily, even if they had no title or position. Today I'm speaking to Jennifer Johnson. She's not only an award-winning businesswoman and lawyer, but she's the immediate past president of the Mississippi Bar Association. The Mississippi Bar is a compulsory bar. Every lawyer in Mississippi has to pay into it, but historically have not been represented by it. Jennifer has set some amazing steps into making an integrated future a reality, and I'm proud to talk to this 21st century lawyer, advocate, award winner, and awesome mother on our podcast today. She starts by talking about how she was elected and the state of the bar at the time. We talk about how some people believe racism in Mississippi is over in spite of the reality. The need to temper honesty with compassion and the strength gained with diversity. We end by talking about personal truths and how people can end up being defined by labels that obscure who they truly are. So without further ado, let's connect with Jennifer. I would like to welcome Jennifer Johnson to our podcast today. Um, she's the immediate past president of the Mississippi Bar Association and a dear friend and somebody that I admire greatly. Thank you for agreeing to join us today. And Jennifer, welcome. Thank you so much, Eckstein. This has been such an exciting thing for me. Um, I haven't done a whole lot of podcasts. I'm a novice at this, but I'm excited that you were the one who gets to kind of usher me into the world of podcast guests. So thank you for having me so much. Absolute pleasure. But let's let, let's dive in. Um, we, I think, the world knows from every Hollywood movie, basically shot with Mississippi in the title or something, that it's not known as the part of the world with the most tolerance. And in, having grown up in South Africa, I sort of feel a kinship with that. How do you get beyond it? You know and. So tell us a little bit about what happened in the last year or so, what, what have you done? And because I already know a few of these, but I'm sure the listeners would love to hear what you've done because I think it's amazing. Well, thank you for the opportunity to share that. Um, I think one real important thing to know about Mississippi is um, there's truth in what you see through Hollywood, uh, but Mississippi also has a very, very strong sense of family and values and Mississippi is a wonderful place. I grew up here, have lived here my whole life with the exception of just a few years, um, raised my children here, um, and have chosen this to be my home now. So there are wonderful things about Mississippi, um, though we are well known for the things that really do make us um, stick out in the world, I guess you could say, uh, for lack of a better term. Um, I have been very fortunate in my life to have lots of opportunity here in Mississippi. And that's primarily because I had a father who just truly believed in me and wanted me to be the best that I could be. Um, I ended up being his law partner. So he and I were law partners for actually 23 years. He is just now recently retired. Um, but he was my mentor, my law partner, my friend. Um, and he is the one who really ushered me into uh, being out in the forefront in my law practice. So that led me to an opportunity to be in front of juries, in front of judges, in front of other lawyers, where I developed a lot of relationships um, here in Mississippi in the legal community that led to my ability to be elected as the president of the Mississippi Bar. So the Mississippi Bar is a mandatory bar, and that means that every lawyer in Mississippi who wishes to practice law must be a member of the Mississippi Bar. So there's no voluntary um, membership there. So the presidency is an elected position, and so it was a statewide election, um, and I was very fortunate and pleased to have won that election a couple of years ago. I was elected as the fifth female bar president, which I think 
for Mississippi is a really cool thing <laughs> that we've had five. Um, we have been in existence for 115 years. So I was the 115th bar president and the fifth female. And I love the way that we ended up electing our very first female bar president. So when it was the 100th year for the bar's existence, the nominating committee, in their wisdom, decided they would nominate only women so that there was no chance that we wouldn't have a female president within our first 100 years. So I thought that was very forward thinking of the uh, nominating committee. And so for you know, our 100th year, we had our first female elected as bar president. So within the last 15 years, five of us um, have been elected to the bar. And some of us have run against men. And um, so, as I did, so I, I ran against a, a male from the coast, um, which is about an hour and a half from where I am. So we're still in the southern uh, district of Mississippi. Um, and so I was successful in that and really grateful to be successful in that. So uh, we have had now um, our third African-American has been elected as president. So our current president of the Mississippi Bar is an African-American, a former Supreme Court justice. Uh, here in, in Mississippi. And uh, so we're very fortunate that we have some diversity and that we seem to be embracing that a little bit more, at least in the legal field, at least as lawyers uh, here in Mississippi, we have done that. So um, that's a little bit about how I kind of got to where um, I was able to serve as president of the bar. And when I was elected to serve as president of the bar, I knew that one of my goals was going to be to diversify our bar a bit further than what it was. So while we have had African Americans in leadership roles um, at the top, we've only had a very few, um, and part of that is because African Americans have just not had an opportunity to get into the leadership um, cycle for our bar. So the way to do that is to serve on committees and then to chair committees. And then from there, you have name recognition and you have a reputation and you have an opportunity to um, rise up into the leadership of the bar. So um, we actually have somewhat of a segregated bar um, because there is a voluntary bar association called the Magnolia Bar, which is the Black Bar of Mississippi. So early on, when black lawyers were admitted to practice, they did not feel welcomed at the Mississippi bar, the big bar, as people call it, the one everybody has to join. So they were required to be members of the Mississippi bar, pay their dues and that sort of thing, but they did not feel welcome. So they started their own bar association called the Magnolia Bar Association. And that is where most of the black lawyers put their service time in is through the Magnolia Bar. So one of the first things that I did um, when it came time for me to work on my committees was to contact the president of the Magnolia Bar, have a conversation, and just say that I would really like to have some additional committee members who um, from the Magnolia Bar who would be willing to serve the Mississippi Bar in addition to their uh, Magnolia Bar service um, so that we would have an opportunity to diversify our committees which then we could diversify our chairships in the next couple of years and then have more opportunity for um, the African-American or minority members of the Mississippi Bar to serve and lead. So I, I did that at the very, very beginning of my presidency, and that kind of set the tone for, um, for how my presidency would go. And so the president of the Magnolia Bar said, here are 30 names of our members who would be willing to serve at the Mississippi Bar under your leadership. And every one of those 30 members who requested to be placed on a committee of the Mississippi Bar were placed on a committee at the Mississippi Bar because that's the primary role of the president is to appoint uh, the committee members and committee leadership. So I felt very successful right off the bat with um, having, you know, at least reached part of my goal, which was to see many more people of color included in the Mississippi Bar's leadership right off the beginning uh, of the presidency. So in the context as well, the George Floyd murder had just occurred um, right before I took office. And so the country 
the United States was ready for a conversation, um, not always willingly ready for a conversation, but the conversation was here. And um, it was a conversation that had to be had. And I felt like um, my position as president of the bar for that year was meaningful because I was able to do some things while it wasn't necessarily out front in front of cameras or in front of the whole membership because of course we were also shut down from COVID. Everyone is behind their computer screen as you and I are today um, in all of our meetings and that sort of thing. But it was something that I was able to do to use my appointment power to quietly um, do a little bit more integration and diversification um, of the bar. So that's that's kind of the platform and the background of um, what I thought my position as president of the bar could do and could be meaningful for. I can imagine that when you make such drastic changes that not everybody finds their place very easily. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges that you faced and how you resolved that? Sure. Fortunately, there was not any sort of public uprising about anything that I did or I said. Uh, fortunately, we did seem to have, at least on the surface, acceptance of, of what had occurred. And I think it was very interesting that it just kind of happened. It's like the first committee meeting by Zoom here all of a sudden we have different colors of faces on our screens. And it was something that was subtle at the very beginning. And then it was like, oh my goodness, you know, we, we have diversified a little bit. Um, I never heard anybody say anything about it. It was not anything that was ever in my face. But having lived in Mississippi my whole life, 50 years now, um, I know that there was talk and I know that there was some discomfort and I know that some of the members of the Magnolia Bar who were serving on these committees did not feel heard, listened to, called upon. Um, you know, there's a difference in being invited to the dance and being invited to the dance and then being invited to dance, actually. Okay, and so what we now have to do is work on inviting others to dance in our um, committees and in our uh, association so that they actually are in leadership positions and that they are actually um, part of the conversations that are going on. I saw a lot of wonderful things happen. I saw a lot of our new friends stepping up to the plate, volunteering to chair subcommittees or co-chair subcommittees um, and one young female um, black lawyer who came on board to the women in the profession committee one of our standing committees um, was so vocal and so outraged over the george floyd incident um, and i knew that she was going to be a strong voice for the committee and so one thing about being president, I don't serve on any of the committees. So after the very first day, I don't, I'm not privy to what is happening in the committees. And so, um, but I knew that she was likely to have a real solid role. And when we got to the bar convention this past July, which was the ending of my presidency, sure enough, at the women's luncheon, there she was as chair of one of the primary committees of the Women in the Profession Committee, um, you know, leading us all in the luncheon and the awards ceremony and, and that sort of thing. And I was just so thankful and so grateful. And I have chills actually as I, I talk about that right now because she, um, she did it. She accepted her role as, as a service member for uh, the women in the profession committee, and she stepped up. And I think she's got a, a bright future in the bar if she continues to want to do that. Um, you know, some challenges I would say that are out there is it's, it's easy to do those sorts of things on a smaller individual scale than it is on the big stage. And so one of the things you and I had talked about previously was um, one of the things I wanted to make sure was that our diversity committee of the bar which has only been in existence for three years. 
if you can believe that, the diversity committee, only three years in Mississippi. Um, it was an ad hoc committee, meaning a temporary committee. And it was at the will and the pleasure of every bar president that, that came along. So the bar president has the right to um, fill an ad hoc committee and keep it going for another year or to just let it go and make another ad hoc committee or, you know, just not fill it. So I wanted to make sure that the diversity committee was one that stayed and I wanted it to become a standing committee of the bar, which actually goes into the bylaws as a committee that must be filled every year by the president, no matter who the president is. So um, I wanted diversity and professionalism committees to become standing committees of our bar. And that was my primary goal for our annual meeting at the convention, which was in front of the entire membership, or at least the people who showed up to the uh, convention. So it was a lot of people. And I knew that was probably the best chance I would have for controversy. Um, it was the, the place where someone may have felt comfortable and emboldened a little bit to speak up and question why I thought the diversity committee should become a standing committee of the bar and that we might have that debate there at the convention. And so when I, you and I spoke right before that, I was telling you, that's the only thing I really had anxiety about um, was how do I handle that debate? Should we have it? Um, and so you helped me tremendously in framing the issue and how to put that forth in an influential way um, to facilitate a positive, good debate over the situation should it occur. I also did a lot of talking to my family members who were there and some very close friends that were there. Um, I had people planted in the audience to make my motion, to second my motion, um, to be prepared to help me with the debate. Um, and as it turned out, I asked for the motion. We got the motion and a second. There was no discussion no debate, and it passed unanimously um, at our convention. So it was a huge win all the way around. Um, but part of me was like, well, we didn't get to have the debate. So when is it time to have the debate? Okay. And on that issue, I'm actually grateful that we didn't have the debate there uh, because I know that it, what my goal was was accomplished was to get that diversity committee to be a standing committee and that I hope there's a time for a debate coming up where we can actually have an open discussion about some of the discomfort that some of the lawyers in Mississippi have. But there are a lot of lawyers in Mississippi who you know, just do not feel that there is a racial issue in Mississippi. They just do not see it. Um, and those are the types of, of people that make me nervous when we talk about having debates because I just don't know how to get through to someone who cannot see that a lawyer in Mississippi who cannot see that. I mean, to me, it's just like, how? Um, but I do believe that it would. there will be a time when um, that debate is coming, and I think it will likely be sometime soon. Perhaps it will be while Robert Gibbs is president, the, the current president. Um, he carries a very strong voice in Mississippi. It's a very strong African-American voice um, and a very strong legal voice. Um, and I think he has the command uh, perhaps to to promote that that sort of a debate. So um, while there are always challenges where race is concerned in Mississippi, I was not faced with it in a real um, aggressive way during my presidency. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. uh, and we and we got that um, motion passed, and I was just so grateful that 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 happened. So you know, part of of why I think that worked so well was preparation. Um, and so in any conversation about my leadership of the bar, I just have to talk about preparation just a little bit, because um, if you leave things to chance in a board meeting, for instance, um, or in an annual meeting, uh, you run the risk of having things kind of go off the rails, um, so to speak. And so I I worked real closely with our executive director and we scripted out our board meetings. So if there was a motion that I needed to make or have made, I had it scripted out. So I had exactly, you know, 
what I wanted to have accomplished. And I have found that people are much more willing to go along with you if you give them the language, if you give them, um, you know, the issue instead of saying, may I have a motion now, you know, after you've had all this discussion about a thousand things, you don't know what kind of motion you're going to get. You know, instead we say, may I have a motion to approve that the diversity committee become a standing committee of the Mississippi bar. <laughs> um, and you're much more likely to have someone say so moved so they don't have to hmm. come up with it themselves. Um, and it's a way to move an agenda forward. And I'm unashamed of the fact that I had an agenda in every meeting that we had. You know, Jennifer had an agenda to move things forward in a progressive way for the Mississippi Bar. And I think there are going to be some people who look back on this this past year and wonder, how did we get here? Because most mm -hmm. of what I did was done quietly. It was yeah. not splashed out on headlines or uh, we didn't have a whole lot of public opportunity um, just because of COVID. Um, mm. you know, things were, were pretty calm. So anyway, those are some of the, the thoughts I had about that. I find it interesting what you're saying, because if you, um, there was a book written, it was about a few years ago, called The CEO Next Door. And they looked at CEOs and people in the C-suite in large companies and companies that were highly successful. And they looked at the characteristics of the people and what they, what their CEOs and C-suite people did, but specifically the focus was on CEOs. And one of the things they say in the book that um, what's well, come out of the research, Harvard Business Review articles, lovely stuff about this as well. Um, but one of the things was clarity. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, and we know that in a time of crisis, creativity is something that that people that that drops people's ability to think differently and think in a different direction becomes much more difficult so finding an alternative in crisis is incumbent upon leaders to come up with something creative and say here is clarity do you agree and in general when the clarity is there people go like ah yes that is what we need to do you get the backing because clarity also gives direction, it gives focus and ability to make decisions. The other characteristic that's highly valued is making decisions, not going into a committee or a long discussion, but going, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to go forward. So the clarity in combination with making the decision is highly valued and is also highly effective. Right. And I think that when you when you have the conversation outside of the, 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 the meeting with people, it's also for me a way to find, I mean, at the moment, I'm going through the Professional Speakers Association and speaking to every single member individually because I'm trying to get an idea of the world's changed. What are you struggling with? What are you battling with? You know, um, where's the pain? And, and how can I help you to alleviate that? And and the, and and the and the stories that I'm being confronted with are sometimes heart wrenching. Sure. Uh, you can imagine a speaking environment where, where with COVID, nobody's going on the stage on the stage anymore, and so the the businesses are decimated. And so finding those voices and helping those voices get a voice, yeah. I think, is such a beautiful thing. Yeah. And so when I listen to you. Yeah, there's this whole, I want to get the point across. I want to make sure that the, that the job gets done and, and, and something happens. But the way in which you do it is actually quite consultative. First figuring out what is needed before voicing it or giving it a voice. And I think that's quite beautiful because it ties in so nicely with what, what great CEOs does. I don't know if you ever realized that you're doing something that great. <laughs> Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I certainly would hope that it's good, um, at least, and that it's in the in the way of goodness. Um, you know, I've been raised uh, by a very southern genteel mother who has been very active in my life, and um, a father who is uh, just the quintessential southern gentleman. Um, you know, and I think there is something about the southern way that lends itself to collaboration, um, to kindness, 
to um, creativity. And so, you know, what you're saying, I really kind of attribute to uh, my, my upbringing. Um, you know, I wasn't real sure I wanted to be a lawyer when I was young, but that was what I knew as a profession. And I had a father who was determined that I would be a professional. He did not you know, he wanted me to be able to take care of myself. And so he, he was the one who really pushed me into um, that direction. And so I had a, a very supportive church family um, as a young person, as a youth. Um, I'm not actively involved in a church anymore. I've kind of moved away from the uh, religious um, side of things. I have a, a much better, bigger spiritual practice today than I ever have. Um, but the religious church stuff um, is just not part of my, my everyday now. But I do credit that and the support of those people in that organization uh, to help me move into a more um, visible, out front role. That's where I learned to sing solos in church and um, you know, when I did well, I got a lot of really wonderful praise. Um, and that was something that really shaped me about, you know, well, you want to be successful in what you do when you are up before people. And so in the courtroom, it's the same thing. Um, you know, getting up to, to speak in front of a jury or speak in front of a judge. Um, all of those tricks that I learned about singing a solo in church when I was a youth translate into being able to stand up, you know, get rid of the nerves or at least use the nerves to my benefit um, in making an argument and speaking uh, before a court and a jury. Um, and that in turn has helped me to be able to stand up uh, or to sit down and lead a board meeting for uh, the bar commissioners. So, um, so I, you know, I can't pinpoint one particular thing, except I would say if, it, if I had to boil it down to one thing, it'd be my upbringing. Um, that has kind of led me to this place of creativity and compassion in what I do. Uh, relationships are very important to me. Networking has always been a very important thing. I mean, when I think about when you and I were in Boston together, in the um, Harvard program on negotiation, there was this instant connection between you and me. I mean, it was like our souls were talking to each other. You know, like, <laughs> oh, we, we have to sit by each other and we have to get to know each other better. And I have been so thankful that we have had an opportunity to stay in touch with each other um, since that time. But you know, relationships mean a lot. I, I developed really good, strong relationships with the members of the bar uh, through my last 23 years of practice because I started out serving on lots of committees. And I started out, um, you know, being present with other lawyers from different parts of the state and lawyers who did different types of uh, legal work from what I did and diversified my exposure to different lawyers across the way, which is, I think, the only way that I was elected in a statewide um, election was because I had taken the time to build bridges, to make relationship. Um, and everybody who's dealt with me, I think they, everybody could be able to say she's been honest, mm -hmm. but she's been kind in her honesty mm. at, you know, the whole way. And, um, so I don't think leaders can separate out being kind and being honest and being creative. Um, if you're going to truly be a leader, truly someone that people want to follow, I think those are two key ingredients, um, kindness and, and honesty. I, th I think that, that, that sort of resonates with me also because um, Kim Scott wrote an interesting book about cognitive, not cognitive, um, radical candor is what she calls it. Ooh, I like that. I'm going to write that down. Yeah, do <laughs> it's a, it's 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 a, something that I like because it, it gives you a very quick way to look at things and um, I sometimes use words that are a little bit more, let's say, confrontational um, in corporate environments, which I wouldn't do here. <laughs> My mum said to always use nice words in public. But anyway, so um, she walks in two axes. She says, well, if you care about people deeply and you want to give them feedback 
that is accurate and clear. So that you've got the radical side, which is like brutal honesty, but deliver it with compassion. Um, you have to also be honest with yourself, and you have to understand what your role is. It and that, that that you do not bring your biases and all this kind of stuff. So. Um, but if the four quadrants, you then splits it in because it's two axes, one about caring and one about being honest. Okay. Um, you get people that are so compassionate that they tell you a little bit of the feedback they should have given you. And then tomorrow, another little bit. And tomorrow, the day after, another little bit. So from the person's perspective receiving the feedback, it's a case of I can never do anything right. Every time I get something to hear, it's all negative. So people that care too much can sometimes be more damaging. The The example she uses in the book, she says, it's like instead of amputating a dog's tail with an elastic or something, it's like chopping off two millimeters every day. It is excruciating. <laughs> Just thinking bad. about that. I think of that as compassionate. <laughs> and then the, you get the other people, they don't really care at all. And they're willing to give you the feedback. We, we, we know the a-hole sort of kind of people, you know, the people yeah. that, that will tell you their, their mind, but you know they don't really give anything about you. you know? right. And then you get those people that don't neither care nor give clear feedback. And they're also known as the company gossip because they give the feedback to someone else that can't do anything with that information. So right. talk about the wrong, to the wrong person about this. And I think that's a nice way of just saying, well, where do you fall? Are you in the radical, cat a radical candor quadrant or are you the person that niggles or the person that's rude or the person that gossips, you know? And within teams and within organizations, it, it's very quick. You very quickly start identifying people. You go like, mm, maybe when somebody comes to me and gives me feedback that's meant for someone else, I should send them in that direction. Right. You know? And every organization has some of all of those. Yeah. And you hope your leader is someone who can bridge the gap <laughs> and maybe yes. uh, smooth the road, I should say, on that. So, um, you know, I've, I've always been kind of a, a smoother, a, a peacemaker, a peacekeeper. That's been my role in my family, and it's been my role in the law practice and, um, you know, in everything that I've done. Um, but I will say several years ago, um, when a very important personal relationship in my life um, deteriorated, I learned how to be honest and how to be honest with compassion um, because it was the right thing for myself and it was the right thing for my now ex-husband. Uh, mm -hmm. I owed it to him to be honest with him about what I was thinking and what I was feeling. And so in my mind, that was the first step that I took was, you know, I really owe that to him, but I didn't only owe it to him. I owed it to myself mm -hmm. um, to to find a way to be honest about what my thoughts really were. And that was the springboard for me, I think, um, in learning how to be honest with those who I, I know are going to disagree with me mm -hmm. um, and how to have that confidence and that bravery to, to stand up and say, well, here's what I think and here's what I, I believe we need and here's why. Um, so, you know, influence comes in to play there. Um, and I like to influence people to come around to my way of thinking. It's not enough for me that you just agree with me. I want you to like agreeing with me. <laughs> um, and so that can be good sometimes. And sometimes that can be a hindrance. Um, mm -hmm. But you have to learn, I guess, when to just say, OK, well, I've, I've done all I can do there. And here's what I think we need to do. And who else is with me? Um, and, and call the vote. Um, you know, so I think what you were saying earlier, you know, take action. Um, yeah. Let's call the vote. Let, let's see where we're going to end up on all this and, um, and see where we go. So um, it, it was a great year for me um, as president of the bar. And I didn't have any major controversies. I didn't, you know, of course, there were things that would come up. And there were certainly those people who express their opinions in not so kind ways and um and that sort of thing but i've just learned that's part of it and you just kind of have to let that roll off your back and uh, yeah. and keep going so um but it has been a great experience and um i've also started a new business um in in the midst of being president of the bar and covid um I, i've started my new business and i have found the skills that i've learned in 
my presidency of the bar has translated very well over into the new business as well. So it was a learning experience for me and something that I'm grateful to have had. There's something you said earlier. You said um, the debate should still be had. And, and, and this is something that stuck with me because you said um, – Something in the lines of the process has been followed and you've created the structures, but the conversation has not been had about, one, why this situation was there in the first place. The, the, the marks it has left on people's lives and their perceptions um, across the racial divide. I mean, it is, it's, it's something that, that I feel very passionate about and how can you get someone to acknowledge that the pain is real? And so I've been looking at some stuff and, and looking at what what we can take from from the scientific side of things. And um, there's a guy in Oxford, I think he is. It's Oxford, Cambridge. Um, anyway, he's in some way related to Sasha Baron Cohen. Uh, it's a professor Baron. It's a professor Baron Cohen. He's in, in. He specifically focuses on people with um, an, an inability to see other people's emotions. So people on the Asperger spectrum or with autism. Um, and he re the research that he's done is about looking for ways to see if people can read faces. So one of the tests he devised called something called the mind in the eyes, and you can literally see, look at just a bunch of eyes and it's been standardized, and can you see the eyes, and can you take the emotion from that? That was then added to 23andMe, which is the genetic company, yeah. and they found genes that can basically predict um, or give an indication that you're statistically more likely to be able to, to have autism or um, or on the Asperger spectrum. The thing that the statisticians in there, however, found is that, but if you have people on the one side of a bell curve, aren't the people on the other side? So one of the things they found is that there are people which has a certain combination of genes that are what I now call super seers. People that can see what you're feeling and articulate it even before you can. I'm, I'm very lucky. I've got a clinical psychologist as part of our company that she just tested way off the scales on this. She's like yeah. amazing at this. Um, but I've also seen is when you have that ability, then you can see when people are struggling with stuff. You can also see where the, with some of the creative idea that you're not maybe missing, those kind of things. So I'm wondering if, if you were to look... One of the things is I think your cognitive empathy ability is actually quite good. You can have it tested. I've got it on my website if you want to. But the, um, but the, I was just going to say what you're what you're saying sounds like empathy to me. That's what I would yes. what I would yeah. call that. And I'm certainly a very strong empath. So <laughs> and so, so the, the, talking about empathy, there's actually three. There's a specific definition of empathy I like, and that's it's got three elements to it: the cognitive empathy, which we just talked me talking about, and that is ability to see. But there's affective empathy as well, which is the, what I call the ability to feel or basically do I give a damn? Right. All right. And then we have compassionate empathy, which is the do, the willingness to do something about it or take action. So for me, it's this, what I call the see, feel, do triangle. Okay. Now, people with an inability to see, let's say with Asperger's or um, anything like that, is you can never blame somebody for not having an ability. But within organizations, when people are in leadership roles and, and they have and don't have this ability, why can't we find somebody to put next to them, to help them be, put a super seer next to them so they can start seeing the impact of what they're doing? The other side of it is, do I give a damn? And if I do, am I willing to do something about it? And I found that in organizations, we've, we've said that, don't do something about it. Don't get involved. Mm. It's not your problem. Mm. You know? Right. And, and that to me is at the crux of where we're now sitting with things like what you've instituted. For many years, we've, we've been taught not to feel, not to be compassionate. But we've also unlearned how to see other people's pain. And so 
when when we think about this, the, the way that I'm trying to explain it these days, people, because I mean, I'm not black, so I I cannot inhabit the pain. I cannot understand the frustration. I cannot go back and do this experience over over, over hundreds of years and be saying, well. My parents, my grandparents, all of, all the people around me has felt that pain. Mm. The closest I get to that is knowing that I lost twenty three family family members in concentration camps in 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 in, um, in the Boer War, you know, and that um, as a gay guy coming out in in the in the nineties in South Africa, I mean, I mean, at high school I was waterboarded, you know, that kind of stuff. So um, and beaten up a lot of times. So you, you you I can understand the that that when when your when your difference is on your skin that the interactions that you have with your environment becomes much more frequent right. so if somebody rejects who you are 10 times a day in the smallest little things that they say how much does that hurt right. and so for me when i look at this um this pain structure. We, 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 there's a research done at Harvard, the, the, uh, if I'm correctly, that is about um, the physical pain sensors of the brain lights up at social rejection. Mm-hmm. Within social rejection, I mean, I think it was MIT and somebody else did a research and they gave people Tylenol. And it was actually less painful, but it's, a, it's been validated. But it's just weird to realize that when we do these things where we ignore people. It's actually like beating them with a baseball bat. And if you get beaten up 10 times a day, we know what this physical violence does to people mentally and and how it scars them for life. And now we need to start looking at what is the responsibility we can take within this and what can we do to make a change. And and so that's why I really applaud what you've done. You've, You've created something that cannot be turned back right that is push things forward and although it might not be the end scenario i think it's the the greatest of starts yes and we have to look at it that way and you know um one of the things that i wish i had been able to accomplish was furthering the conversation between the leadership of the mississippi bar and the leadership of the magnolia bar so my year started with that kind of conversation president to president Um, And we brought in um, larger groups of our leaders and we had a a Zoom call uh, back in, you know, the early part of my uh, presidency um, where the leadership was able to talk to one another. And it was a very, very emotional time in a positive way, I think. And and probably my favorite story about this, because we had... Uh, The president of the Magnolia Bar invited the people that she wanted to be part of this conversation. I invited the people I wanted to be part of the conversation. And we had a conversation. And one of the people that um, the president of the Magnolia Bar invited was an 80-year-old retired black attorney. And he had to come to her office because he didn't know how to work Zoom. And um, he was usually called in to fix a problem. So when he was told, we've got a meeting with the Mississippi Bar, I'd like for you to come into the office and be part of this discussion. His frame for that was going into problem solving mode. Oh my goodness, what's going on? And he, he was in kind of a defensive posture when we first started the meeting. And as the meeting went along and everyone, well, mostly the members of the Magnolia Bar had an opportunity to express their experience with the bar that had been negative, Mm -hmm. their um, desires for the bar going forward. And there was no pushback from the leadership of the Mississippi Bar. We all just listened and we affirmed what they were saying and we offered that we were willing to work with them to try to change this history, this long-standing history. And toward the end of the meeting, this retired gentleman sat there with tears streaming down his face and offered to speak. And he said, 
I had no idea what this was going to be about, but this was the last thing I would have ever thought that we would have actually had a conversation. He said, in my entire career, we have never had this much conversation. Mm -hmm. And he was just overcome with emotion, which of course was very emotional for those of us uh, from the Mississippi bar as well, because that, and for me in particular, because that's exactly, you know, the door that I wanted to have opened. So that was positive and that was good. And that was at the very beginning of my mm -hmm. term. And then um, there was going to be a survey from the members of the Magnolia Bar that they were going to share with the leadership of the Mississippi Bar so that we could continue the conversation. And my understanding is the survey was sent out to the membership of the Magnolia Bar and the comments that came back were not such that they felt they could send it to the Mississippi Bar. Okay. Mm. So while the leadership was able to come to a table and have some common ground, the membership as a whole had, was not part of that conversation. They had not been led to the place mm. where we had ended up. And there is just so much animosity and so much fear, I think, um, from their side that they were unwilling to follow through and say, we want to continue the conversation because they felt at that point, the conversation could not be continued in a constructive way. Mm. So we didn't have any more meetings among the leadership. That's another thing that I'm hopeful Robert Gibbs, our current president, is going to be able to do because he's a member of both organizations. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that he will have the uh, valence to be able to cross that divide and say, let's start the conversation on a on a membership level, let's start having these kinds of conversations and move forward. And I do think the committee structure now at the bar mm -hmm. and the new members of, of the committees at the Mississippi Bar will help bring that along. Um, they will have experienced something positive at the Mississippi Bar, I hope, and be able to share that with the membership of the Magnolia Bar. But, you know, um, integration would certainly be the ultimate goal. We, we took it a little teeny tiny step toward mm -hmm. that. Um, and I'm, I'm just anxious to see how that can move forward um, in the future. Um, I, and I will be around and I will do everything that I can do to help facilitate that from the confines of my um, membership of the Mississippi Bar um, and, and not in a leadership role anymore. But um, anyway, those those are just some thoughts um, about about that and how. Maybe that's a challenge. Maybe that's a disappointment that that didn't move along a little further than it did during my year. But I do think we had an excellent start. And the the empathy factor that we were just talking about, um, watching the faces on that Zoom screen during the the whole meeting. You know, everybody kind of started out stiff and defensive and just not sure where this was going. And by the end of it, people had relaxed and you know, and the emotion was able to come forward for everyone who was involved. So um, I, I do see that and I, I thrive on that sort of thing. And I feel what everybody else is feeling to the extent I have knowledge to feel that way. But I mean, I can, mm. I can tell very quickly walking into a room even mm. you know, where the emotion of the room uh, is. And, and I do feel like that's a good, um, a, a good place from which, to lead um, so that you are aware of what your your members are thinking and feeling and and where things may ultimately go I think it's a I think it's an interesting observation the do you okay um, when we did the program uh, the, the second week we talked about difficult conversations I mean we looked at conflict management and and um, mediation and things like that i didn't um, stay for the second week but i read the book difficult conversation yeah and that's no, something that has really shaped it's a great oh, book for that yeah book. there's there's the, the next book that they wrote after that douglas and sheila was about um feedback and they talk about different types of feedback and different types of triggers which i think is a great conversation to have anyway 
But there was a guy in the course in the second week um, who is a hostage negotiator. All right. Um, I didn't realize who it was <laughs> until much later. Um, and it was Chris Voss. And he was the FBI lead negotiator. Wow. And um, so we talked about a lot of stuff and he... Um, he had it very. He was very opinionated about certain things. Um, did not always right at the forefront, but you did see the certain things that that, that that sort of didn't sit well with him. And he wrote a book um, later about, and, and he reflects back on that class. Oh wow! <laughs> and, yeah. And how he doesn't agree with a lot of stuff that was said, and, and uh, how the FBI has come up with other ways of doing this. And so recently, just as I add on to that, I started doing some in, some really interesting coaching training that I've been participating in. So I've been looking at how do you bring all this kind of stuff together? How do we take negotiations and conflict management and hostage negotiation items and how we bring the, all those things together? So I'm busy working on this little hour, hour, hour and a half long walk that we're going to do here in Amsterdam through the parks with the members of Professional Speakers Association um, and getting to know each other better. Mm -hmm. And one of the techniques is something that Chris talks about but how to establish rapport with a, with a hostage taker, you know? And it's, I mean, the first instinct is, no, I don't want to have any compassion for this person. You know, um, they must just do as they're told kind of thing, which they're not going to do. You can, uh, and if you mess up on the negotiation, there's lives at stake. So you can't, you can't just do whatever you like. But one of the things he talks about in there is we've all been told to summarize what somebody else says, you know, so take what they say, then summarize it because it shows you've been listening. Um, he calls the paraphrasing. He actually calls the summary something which is paraphrasing and labeling the emotion. And what we tend to forget is to say, well, that sounds frustrating or that sounds like it really hurt. Right. Now, giving voice so you can show that you understand the emotive side. And I think in these kind of conversations we, 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 that, that you've been part of, and I think that still needs to happen with you, as you said, um, Maybe that is an interesting thing to try out, to have two conversations from the different two bars, to have two lawyers with diametric opposed views, just have a conversation, just walk, all right? And the only questions you're allowed to ask is how and what, not allowed any hot inquiry, no why statements, nothing like that, no statements, just ask why and how, how can we move the conversation? What did you feel when that happened? You know, those kind of questions. Yeah. And then acknowledge by paraphrasing and acknowledge with the emotional labeling. And I think that's the way in which I believe that white guys and women can have the conversation because it's a way for us to structure the listening so that we can hear what is being said we can focus on the words and we can focus on the emotion and start to understand the pain. Right. It's the common ground um, to me that that keeps coming to me as you're talking about this, um, which I find it's hard for some people to identify common ground. We live mm -hmm. in a, uh, an us them type of a society these days. And so it's hard for us to identify with them. And mm. there's always something that we can identify with, with other humans. Yeah. I mean, we have so much in common. We may express ourselves in very different ways and we have viewpoints and beliefs and uh, faith systems and all those sorts of things that um, are completely different, that give us a, a different lens, you know, through which we look at the world. Mm. But we all have common ground. We are all human at the very core. We all experience the same emotions, uh, just mm -hmm. about different things and in different and in different ways. So I love what you're saying, though, about um, you know finding that emotion, naming what that emotion is, because to me that is what is common about all mm -hmm. of us. And when we can yeah. start identifying with other people on those common things. Um, common emotions, common uh, beliefs, that's when you start to really make progress. In I agree. Yeah. Uh, the, something you said, that the us and them thing, it, 
It is actually something that happens at nine months of, of age. So at three months of age, I mean, there's this lovely program called Babies on Netflix. And in the very first episode, they talk about this, about how human um, mental development and neurological development. And so I went and looked at the research papers. And what they're basically saying in there is true. There's some nuance in it in, in the papers. But at three months of age, summary, at three months of age, you learn to differentiate different faces. So all of a sudden, you can recognize individuals. It doesn't matter if it's anybody in the primate family. You can see the difference. At nine months, we start identifying more and more with our primary caregiver. Mm -hmm. So if it's a white baby in a black family or a black baby in a white family, from that point onwards, your primary caregiver is the person that you will most easily recognize. It doesn't mean we can't see pain in other people's faces, but the, the pain that we see is more recognizable if it's someone that looks like our primary caregiver. Someone you bonded with. Yeah, but it's also something that you learned. It's a learned behavior and a learned recognition. And everybody that doesn't look like them, like your primary caregiver, becomes a them. They become a group. They have no individual identity anymore. So what we need to do, I think, is to break through that, that them and go to the you, to the individual, so that we can have those individuals. And when we have enough individuals from a group, it changes our perception of that group. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so when we have these conversations, we need to talk about the things that are painful. So we can start recognizing the pain in faces that we were previously blind to. Correct. Absolutely. I, I have a girl here. Um, her name is Keo. I absolutely adore her. She's um, she's Setswana and she's from South Africa. And um, I met her by speaking Setswana to her in the hallway, which is a weird thing that I do in Europe. Whenever I see a black person, I speak Setswana to them in the hope that they are from my neck of the woods where I grew okay. up, which is close to Gaborone in, in Southern Africa and Botswana. And so, um, and she spoke, she just looked at me like really <laughs> weird once this white guy talking to Setswana to me. And um, then we started having a conversation and she said something recently, which I, which I was, I was just shocked and dismayed by, and it got me thinking about this whole thing. What, what do we see? You know, she had explained to someone that she was going through some serious emotional turmoil um, because something that had happened. And the person basically accused her of lying. Because we used to seeing the emotions in someone's face and then hearing it in their voice and then hearing the content of the conversation. And now she was expressing the content of the conversation and the voice, but her face was not recognizable to the person she was speaking to. And the assumption was made she's lying because the person is half blind. So how do we open people's eyes to the pain? You know, that, that to me is the first thing. And that's why I want to have those conversations here in the Netherlands, in my environment, to see how can we just talk about what's painful and what's joyous. We, we, we shouldn't forget about the joy, you know. And, and, and how do we recognize that in each other's faces? And how do we make that into something that be, is becoming of us as human beings? And then I think the next step for that is honoring everyone's experience. So many times someone will say, well, that can't be true or that must not be true because they don't trust me enough to express my own experience in a positive mm -hmm. way because maybe mm -hmm. they've never experienced it that way. So, um, you know, as much as it is about physical recognition and the, the physical part of that sort of thing, um, I think it goes a lot deeper than that as well for, for people just are not willing to honor my truth or mm. someone else's truth. Um, you know, black to white, male to female, um, homosexual to straight. You know, I mm -hmm. mean, all of these differences that we have, the categories that we put each other into, many times we, we're not willing to really honor the experience of, of people that we consider other than ourselves. 
And um, I think truly if there's anything that I want to see happen in the world with relationships, it is that we can find a way to knock down those fences mm. and that we can find a way to truly soul connect um, mm. so that we're getting rid of all of the the lenses that we wear that are placed on us many times before we even know it. I mean, a nine month old baby's not making a, a conscious decision about that. Right. I mean, it's placed mm. on that, that baby by our experiences and by our, um, our world and the people that they're around and, um, and that sort of thing. And so how do we peel those away enough to where we see the human um, in each person, regardless of the categories that they're in. And, um, you know, to me, that's a, one of those things that I meditate on and, and am hopeful for, uh, that we can reach that in my lifetime. Mm. I think that's a, that's a, that's a great page to sort of park, to, to park this conversation, maybe to another time to continue. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's a, it's a good wish and, and I cannot anything but agree with that. Yes. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Well, Jennifer, thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate you taking the time. And um, as always, it's great talking to you. It has been my pleasure. Thank you, Eckstein. You know, when talking to Jennifer today, it really brought back some memories for me from home. When I grew up, my best friend, when I was six, just before I went to school, and I was playing in a uh, in the dirt with some little cars and Johnny's mum called him and she was always a little bit impatient so he had to run off to her grab a bottle ran around the corner and as he ran he, I heard him scream and I ran over to him and Johnny had fallen and in an effort to save the bottle it held onto it really tightly and it cut open his stomach I sat now down next to Johnny, both of us crying, and um, waited for the hospital, eventually for the ambulance to pick him up. And um, my mum had brought out her newly brought tea towel, you know, um, just weird stuff that you remember, and um, soaked in some salty water. And we kept in Johnny's guts. It, it's one of those things that you don't wish on any six year old. But four months later, Johnny had not survived, and I went to school. When I told the story of Johnny, people told me that he didn't matter, because Johnny was black. That's the first time I was confronted with labels that disregarded people. And I must say one thing, it's been the joy of my life, keeping the memory of Johnny alive, also now with the company that I've erected, to help people connect and to give labels a different place. Now go out there, be exponential and do something nice for someone else. You can find us on the web by going to podcast.exponentially.me We will also find additional media resources and some amazing insights.